Hello gamers and history people, time for another Viking video as Assassin's Creed Valhalla is now being enjoyed by many. I've gone over political, population, and climate reasons for the Viking invasions, and touched briefly on the militaristic drives of the Viking Age, but today we're going to look over our last reason for the Viking expansions – money. Or in a more real sense, the economic and financial situations that bolster the Viking need for conquest. Economic history is popularly attached to Karl Marx, Frederick Engel, and the Communist Manifesto, and thus people only really look from the 19th century onward in terms of how economics and industry have shaped the world. But money and trade have been a part of civilization for thousands of years, and looking at history through those lenses can be very enlightening. Economic history does just that, so we'll try to use that same focus for the Viking Age. What was going on in the financial world of Scandinavia and during the early medieval period? But before we begin, please consider subscribing to help grow the channel and click the bell button to be notified for more history and game videos. Also, check out my Patreon page and join others to help support more history. Obviously, we need to set the stage for the economic world that would draw out the Vikings. Thus, we shall look into Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East. Let's start by looking at the latter. The rapid spread of Islam united many of the desperate faiths of the Middle Eastern region. The different empires and kingdoms that arose were large and powerful, which meant that those within their borders could enjoy trade in a rather more peaceful environment than the smaller kingdoms and tribes that constantly warred with each other could. By the 9th century CE, science, education, and other cultural developments evolved and grew. While the medieval Middle East was not free from conquest and fighting, it happened at a much less destructive scale than other places, such as Europe. And major conquests such as the latter Crusades and Mongol hordes would still try to keep up the infrastructure that had developed, Chinggis being the exception. The Khwarezmians should have just accepted the deal. The Abbasid Caliphate rose to dominance over the old Umayyad rule in the mid-8th century CE. Much of North Africa, the Levant, and Middle East fell under their control. As long as you didn't live on the border, and therefore weren't in danger of raids and counteroffenses by neighboring powers, you could find yourself in a pretty peaceful climate where trade flourished. Goods coming from China, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Europe all made this zone extremely rich in goods, tribute, slaves, gold, and other forms of wealth of the time period. The abundance to be had drew in merchants from all places in return. This helped to spread the goods back out to Europe, Africa, and Asia, creating major trade networks in the process and generating more wealth for all involved. The goods thus provided revenue for not only kings, but for whole cities in the form of more trade and barter in thousands of smaller village systems that ultimately connected themselves to the larger trade routes. In Europe, goods and services flowed everywhere. The development of better transportation methods, banking, and loans in the 9th century made Europe a bustling place of international trade. Far away in Saxon England, coins minted there traveled as far as Rome. In return, merchandise from the Mediterranean came up through Italy and rushed northward. Goods in the Holy Roman Empire traveled south, west, east, and north. Europeans hadn't seen trade on this scale since the time of the Romans a few hundred years before. The kings and other opportunists of Scandinavia must have heard of the riches the kingdoms to their south were making, and knew that while they did receive some of it, their lands were often so far north that few of the goods made it to their villages. With political changes on the way, growing populations trying to support themselves, and lacking a central financial institution that was able to print gold, they had to go out and find fortune, and inject their economy with wealth from other places. This usually entails the need for expanding an economy. As places grow and leaders try to enhance their power, warfare, prosperity, and increased administration all call for more money and more financial opportunity. Basically, as goods and services expanded, the more opportunities grew in order to access them. Raid and trade presented those opportunities for the Vikings. I have talked about raiding before in my videos, but I didn't give much into where or the economic benefits for the Vikings. While the Vikings raided many locations, one of their favorite areas they liked to return to was England, which is where players would be doing most of their raiding in the game. Why England? As mentioned last time, England was very fractured politically. While there were several Saxon kingdoms, they were not alone and often at odds with each other. 
Not to mention the Angles, Irish, Welsh, and Picts conducting raiding themselves and causing general trouble. England was very divided and weak because of it when the Vikings came in the late 8th century. Whether the Viking incursion was dumb luck or planned genius, we don't know, but England must have presented easy pickings. While villages and other places were targeted, monasteries and religious centers were attacked more frequently because the monks had that pleasant little rule about not carrying any weapons and therefore not being able to defend themselves in any way, shape, or form. Added to that, the monks presided over the massive riches monasteries and churches stored on their grounds. Vikings weren't really interested in trying to rule new lands at first. They were interested in extracting wealth and transferring it back home to their rulers and chieftains, or use that wealth to become a chieftain themselves back home. Ships were only loaded with warriors and had plenty of room to store stolen goods. Now, gold and silver items upon return could not be eaten, and they might look nice on someone's mantle, but most likely they were melted down, made into coinage, and spent within their society. This increased the standard of living through rulers hiring artisans, engineers, and attracting merchants of north to not only increase personal power, but also increase the resources available to their people, giving access to new developments and technologies. We'll talk about the development of coinage and bullion a little later, but let's just stick to the goods for now. Inanimate objects were not the only items for trade, however. Some prisoners were turned into slaves, who could be used to help with labor on larger farm fields, or increase the productivity of other tasks. These prisoners could also be sold to other cultures that had a need for them, such as the Islamic and Byzantine cultures to the east and southeast, making the Vikings a tidy profit as middlemen. Slaves were called thralls, and their trade was a mainstay of Viking economies, especially the Swedes. And while many were people who were captured in battles and raids, sometimes they could also be other Scandinavians who just owed massive debt, or who inherited that position from their parents. Many households had at least one or two slaves, freeing up their masters for other profitable activities in the society, or being used for more nefarious acts behind closed doors. If not sold away, they could gain their freedom from a generous master granting it, or through their own payment for it. They could also just be killed, as there was evidence of rampant abuse on some of the remains found that are believed to be thralls from the Viking Age. Thralls could also be the labor used to build and refit ships once the Viking Age got into full steam. Labor needs, abuse of all forms, and sale profits meant that there was a big market that constantly needed to be filled. So while we see pictures of Vikings hauling gold and silver and other items after a raid, we need to remember that there were tied up groups of humanity being led to the ships as well. Many thralls were Gallic, Balts, Slavs, and Latin Roman peoples. So early and tremendously profitable raids, such as Lindisfarne and others, created a gold rush of sorts where individual Vikings who wanted to gain wealth and status for themselves began raiding on their own, without permission from the chieftains. Nowhere near any water, be it ocean or river, was safe. Viking ships raided England, France, the Iberian Peninsula, and eastward towards the lands of modern-day Ukraine and Russia. With the conquest, merchants followed, going so far as North Africa, Italy, and the Byzantine Empire. All this money and opportunity led some chieftains and enterprising individuals to consider not only raiding to extract wealth, but to set up their own operations abroad. Chieftains began fighting each other and foreign armies, expanding and counter-expanding their control of the land and peoples of Scandinavia and other kingdoms. If you found yourself on the losing side, found less opportunity to support your family, or some other reason, the foreign lands might seem like a good spot to actually begin setting up a new life. Towards the mid to late 800s, the same time as Yusuf's Assassin's Creed Valhalla takes place, Vikings began not only bringing warriors, but also women and children. Families were now coming over, indicating that people were coming to settle, rather than just the usual smash and grab job. In England, the Danes took over large swaths of land, eventually called the Dane Law, where Danish laws were enforced rather than English ones. Dublin and Ireland was taken by Norwegian Vikings and became an even larger trade center than it was of gold, silver, and slaves, making many Norsemen, and a few Irish, rich in the process. The 
The Duchy of Normandy was established on the northern French coast by Danish and Norwegian Vikings, eventually being called the Normans, who would go on to even larger fame in medieval history, reaching into Italy, Sicily, as well as conquering England. The West Frankish King Charles III granted it to the Norse leader Rollo if he would defend it from other Vikings. Some ventured further west across the oceans into Iceland, Greenland, and North America. However, the latter two settlements would eventually fail due to poor resource management and antagonizing the natives. They mostly went back east, starved, or met a violent end at the hands of the earliest form of Canada's homeland security. But Iceland stuck in there and is still going strong today. While we like to focus on battles and conquest, we must also realize that each base established connected to a growing and increasingly efficient Nordic trade network in the West. But the same was also being done in the East. While most media platforms love the image of Vikings raiding Saxon England and all that goes with it, it's easy for most people who get their history lessons off of TV to not notice that the Vikings also moved East. Mainly Swedish Vikings traveled into the lands that, according to legend, bore their name, the Rus, or Russia today. They would later be dubbed the Varangians by the Byzantines. They took over many of the Slavic dominions and set up kingdoms. They taxed the people and expanded trade eastward into Central Asia and southward towards Constantinople. Asian and Greek silk, glass, jewelry, spices, slaves, and other valuables were exchanged for Nordic furs, honey, mead, iron, silver, gold, and of course, more slaves. Many individuals made fortunes. We think of the Vikings so much as bloodthirsty and violent maniacs that we forget that they were also bloodthirsty and violent business people, as were many people of the medieval ages. The Varangians' first real standout leader was Rurik, who, with his successors, set up towns and conquered others to control the major river traffic into the Black Sea, setting themselves up to trade in the rich markets of the Byzantines. These markets, of course, connected to the precious trade centers of Baghdad and more. Becoming essentially middlemen, they transferred goods from their own territories and those of Scandinavia and Europe to the markets of Asia and vice versa. The Byzantines in the 10th century even began to employ some Varangians, as well as Saxons, into an elite fighting force, the Varangian Guard. They, along with other Vikings, left their marks on the places that they settled. Let's talk coinage and bullion real quick. At the start of the Viking Age, Vikings were accustomed to using precious metals in bulk, also known as bullion. They used a system of exchange that was based on weights of metal, not a particular coin. Most people at the time could tell at a glance what a piece of metal should weigh, and big pieces were often melted down into small, manageable ones, into things like jewelry. Silver was probably the most widely circulated, although gold did find its way at times into the market. This was a slightly more economical way to purchase goods than just bartering, in that there was a clear and recognized medium of exchange. The only coins that did make it into circulation at first were those from other kingdoms, and not just from the west, but also coins from Islamic empires from the east that made it through the trade routes into Scandinavia. But as Vikings began to raid and expand, they were increasingly paid in coinage for tribute or open trade, and they began to adopt a coinage as a new form of payment. These coins were still based on weight, but there was more uniformity to them than random trinkets of silver. Hundreds of coins fell into use. There were the crude beginnings of Scandinavian coins, mixed with hundreds of English, Arabian, and other forms from various lands. By the early 11th century, Viking coins became more distinct, with images of great kings and rulers placed upon them, inscribed with designs influenced from foreign coins. Each region in Scandinavia and other settlements had individualized designs and varied from ruler and time period. With coins and their increasing consistency, allowed the Viking economy to develop rapidly and grow. It was now easier for them to trade and invest in foreign kingdoms, and therefore could use their wealth more efficiently. It was also much easier to link their centers of enterprise together, creating new and large trade infrastructure. Everyone using similar types of coins meant that business was much faster and organized, which bolstered profits. The Viking Age doesn't end in some climactic battle, although many were fought. The other cultures of Europe did not send the Vikings back to where they came from or made some deal. A combination of factors led to the end, 
But a popular reason would be that over time, the settlements of the Vikings mixed and absorbed into the cultures around them. But this is often a simplification, implying that Nordic peoples left no impression on history other than some cool stories and a few words still used in modern languages. Parts of their culture did last into the modern day, such as being judged by a group of your peers when in a trial setting, for example, and much more. But how did the age itself really end? The Vikings disappeared mainly because they were independent entities in a world that no longer needed them. Rulers and kings began to emerge from the chieftains, with all the power and wealth that had come to Scandinavia over the three centuries. The Viking Age was like the medieval version of the American Wild West, although much longer. There was a lack of law on a grand scale. Rule was localized. Viking raids struck out at riches and land that didn't belong to them. They simply took that wealth and transferred it to themselves, without having to do much in terms of the merchant work at first. But in doing so, they created trade routes of their own, and conquering new lands led to settlement and producing their own goods, which helped them engage in legitimate trade with other nearby cultures. Viking leaders now had incentives to protect trade routes, because now it was their own goods that were produced. They had incentives not to take slaves anymore, because they needed those people as subjects to work the new fields and more. They also had incentives to stop other Vikings, because now the rulers were the ones with the power and interests who the raiders could potentially prey on. The Wild West ended once society became more organized and connected itself to the larger nation with better transport and strong rule of law. The same happened with the Viking Age. Raids weren't as profitable or as steady as trade. Rulers and kings wanted more peace within their lands in order to foster better productivity. It was time to manage subjects and protect them from outside dangers, rather than be the danger. More structured forms of government and society were needed to connect all the territories the former Vikings had conquered. Now there are trade ships sailing from Iceland to the British Isles to the lands of Scandinavia. Goods flowed from the Byzantines and Caliphates to be exchanged for goods the Nordic peoples produced. Rulers from mainland Europe practiced regular diplomacy with the new Nordic kingdoms. The size of all this required more organization and planning than the administrative demands of small chieftains who worried more about how to gain warriors and manage small villages. Vikings, after the consolidation of law and order, simply became outlaws rather than a crucial part of the economic machine, because the machine itself changed. The Viking Age, with the wealth it brought in and the contacts made, created a level of prosperity within Scandinavia that gave rise to the kingdoms of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Local chieftains gave way to the kings. But that's the episode for today, and I hope you enjoyed it. Please click the like button to help bring this video to new viewers, and subscribe for more future content on Vikings and other history videos. Also, consider supporting the channel on Patreon, and get your name in the end credits. Unfortunately, the Brave browser is cancelling its supporter links, so mine will no longer work from this point in time. I ask you to please consider evermore the support on Patreon, so that I may be able to spend more time creating videos and experiment with new software to grow the channel. Lastly, I would like to thank all my subscribers for continuing to support the channel, and thank you to those who are here for the first time. I'm Eric the Lone Pine Wolfman, and remember gamers, never stop learning.